And as for our last panel today, we turn to solutions providers from Europe and the Americas as we chat with founders Geert Van Unen of Taraki, Mario Murillo of Solutions for IoT, and Nicola Andelik from My Voice, moderated by myself. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Charlene. I'm a marketing analyst at Naren. I'm very proud to be moderating the solutions provider panel as we're joined by some of the brightest minds in the industry pioneering the future of AI adoption in consumer and enterprise spaces. Uh, today joining me are Geert Jan Van Union, CCO of Teraki, an edge AI solutions provider company whose mission is to enable personalized and accurate machine learning based applications without a compromise towards 100% safety. On the other hand, we also have Nicola. Um, and uh, Nicola is the co-founder of My Voice, an AI company whose mission is to unlock the power of voice using the latest machine learning technologies. And we also have Mario Murillo, founder of Solutions for IoT, an edge AI solutions provider company that is committed to build a better world by transforming companies with the correct application of IoT. Um, so, gentlemen, could you please tell us a bit about what you do and how AI is connected? And to begin, um, I want to start with uh, Mario. Could you please um, talk a bit about how, how do you leverage edge AI to build in concert with the cloud? Yeah, so basically we are building solutions for our customers so that they, uh, they can make better solutions uh, with inf smart information. So I, we, we have been building a, a platform that sends and monitors uh, like health smart lighting uh, solutions to better, better make decisions on, on uh, energy uh, savings. And that's one way that uh, our solutions are help, help, helping uh, deploy IoT in, in LATAM at the moment. Uh, thank you, Mario. Um, would you want to go a bit deeper into how um, Edge interacts with cloud in this case, however? Yeah, so basically our solution, our solution gathers information on, on the energy consumption uh, uh, location and sends the, the data to the cloud. And in the cloud, it, it makes, uh, uh, excuse my, my, my English and train of thought here, but <laughs> basically <laughs> I'm a little nervous. I've never done this over the... the a Zoom call, but basically- Yeah, it's fresh for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the cloud, we have a platform uh, where the data uh, gets stored, and basically uh, it gets uh, programmed to, to be able to either uh, turn off the lighting, smart lighting, in, in public smart lighting, for example, and, uh, and also gathers information about, about uh, high peak voltages. Uh, and if there is a, a, a lighting that is not working, it gives alarms, sends alarms to, to the, to the uh, proper department so that they can make uh, the proper arrangements to fix the lighting and so on. So basically that's, that's the, the solutions that we are making at the moment. Okay, thank you, Mario, for the intro. Um, Gert, would you also like to chime in a little bit on how you leverage AGI um, to build in concert with the cloud? Yes, of course, uh, Chilin. Thanks. Uh, um, yeah, we interact. Actually, we, we work both at the edge and at, at the cloud. We have we have software for for edge and cloud, and what we in essence do is uh, is select relevant information from from sensors. So we we we, uh, we target. Uh, the automotive, robots, and drone markets, uh, vehicles, or, or uh, things that are equipped with a lot of sensors, such as cameras, uh, IMU, uh, lidar, radar, and these sensors produce a lot of information. And what we do for our customers is actually to, in that stream of information, in that stream of data, to select uh, the very important and relevant uh, either objects or events that they require to train a certain AI model, uh, so to do machine learning in, in the cloud. So what we actually do is 
a prototype AI, pip, AI pipeline uh, bridging edge and, and cloud uh, for the customers to, to configure what uh, and how they would like to train a specific uh, machine learning model in, in the cloud. And um, by doing this smart and uh, efficient uh, uh, ingestion of edge information, we make this process very fast and, and uh, but also enable our customers to improve and improve the reliability of their machine models as we've productized this in an in a automatic learning loop. And finally, um, on, on the edge side, we have a very tiny piece of software that actually uh, operates on, on low energy, low CPU, low RAM uh, at, the, at, the, at the edge. I see, Kurt. So it really is uh, the edge features that, that allow this efficiency to happen to make the to cherry pick the data that is needed. Is that what I'm getting here? Exactly, because if you if you train a model, uh, and particularly for autonomous driving, you need to uh, collect huge amounts of video data or, or LiDAR data in order to get a, a, a reliable model. And this, this entire process we speed up by doing it uh, uh, more efficiently, but moreover, uh, more intelligently. Thank you, Gear, for your input. That's very interesting, and um, it certainly is something that's very needed at this point. We have this data um, being a big explosion everywhere. And um, this said, moving on forth to uh, Nicola, would you please talk a bit on also how my voice is leveraging edge AI and cloud? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So my name is Nicola. I'm one of the co-founders of My Voice AI. And just to give you a little bit of introduction of what we are doing, we are taking voice and basically adding a, a human a biometric uh, a factor to it. So basically what we do, we recognize people in any language, dialect or grammar via voice. And it's a, usually in the world, it's called biometric technology. And we believe this will unlock uh, quite a lot of possibilities, both in the edge and AI. So the way we make both work is that, uh, the, as, as, as the gentleman's before explained, machine learning models uh, require a lot of data and a lot of data to process it. So it goes for the human voice. Uh, the way we are doing that and, and to improve it, we have a hybrid model where we are learning the model on the edge and sending the, the, the derived learnings from that model at the edge up to the cloud to improve the overall world model. Uh, I would, I think if you go on Google, you will find out a term for that, for this called federated learning, which means if you have, for example, 100,000 people around the globe using biometric out technology, biometric technology to recognize, to do payments or access control, we learn of each individual model, we send it to the world model up there anonymously, and then we can send the derived learnings to all of the model. So it's pretty important for us to be able to learn from individual use cases, individual um, from all individuals around the world to improve this to be uh, as accurate as possible. Thank you, Nicola. And I think the point you mentioned actually leads me to think about data privacy issues because right now there's a lot of um, angst, anxiousness about data being sent to the cloud. But you were saying that um, you're able to have all the um, information being processed on on the device and only the final inference go to cloud. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, and I, I would actually uh, like to kind of elaborate on that. So this is kind of uh, to explain the question about how do they work together, and this is for, for, for kind of for the big corporation, for banks, financial institutions, but where we are actually moving with all of this, I think all the AI, all the all the neural network acceleration eventually will happen at the edge, and to be able to do that, you need to have a, enough power uh, processing the chips needs to be able to accelerate new, uh, accelerate neural networks and kind of one of our biggest reasons that why we are seeing growth in the in the semiconductor space is that we can do the biometric authentication of the human voice at the edge and this is the stuff you know i'm, I'm sure you you know you at neuron you know you were you working a lot of it access control you already are familiar with face we believe this should be done together at the edge and never actually leave the edge so this is why we believe that privacy is very important and, and in terms of voice biometric solution for my voice is we no, never store any voice files. We only store the derived, so inference derived learnings of the machine learning models. And this actually gives us a quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of, uh, you know, good traction, especially in Europe where privacy is super important. Yes, yes. Thank you, Nicola. I see that our other panelists also want to chime in a bit. Do we want to start with Geert? Yes, uh, Jolene. Uh, uh, yeah, at Taraki, what we do is uh, very similar to, to what Nicola just said. 
uh, the, our, our end goal is to have uh, these um, uh, algorithms run at the edge. So we allow our customers to ingest the data, train the models in the cloud, but then push them uh, back to the edge where they can uh, run in a very efficient way, very accurately. And uh, so if, whether it's a uh, mood detection, phase detection, lane departure, traffic light detection, or, or any other uh, robot or, or um, uh, automotive use case, uh, at the end of the day, it should run in the car for multiple reasons. It's for, for, for speed, latency, and you cannot rely on, on, on network transmission for, uh, for safety related functions. It's, it's for cost, for economics, but also, uh, as, as you rightly, and Nicola rightly uh, uh, pointed towards, for, for privacy. So it, yes. never, it never leaves the car or the, or the device where it's used. I see. So that seems to be the general direction we're going forth with moving to the edge. Everything happens on the edge. Um, Mario, do you have something to chime in about this topic as well? Yeah, we, we at Solutions for IoT believe that, you know, the, the privacy at the edge is very important since most of the edge nodes are closer to the users or close to the devices. So the importance of this uh, private sensitive data is, 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 needs to be kept very, very secure. So no, <clears throat> normally you, you don't want to send a lot of data to, to, to the cloud because you're going to generate large amounts of data. The data centers will be, will be overloaded with a, a lot of information. So you want, you want to train uh, your machines or, or use the use of, of intelligence in these in in these edge devices is 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 much more efficient uh, than sending it to the cloud so that's that's what we are focusing on i see thank you mar so it does seem that um privacy is going to be a huge benefit of edge ai but on top of that i'm hearing words such as um latency and also just off the top of my head, it seems intuitive that there's also problems with connectivity when it's using cloud. So um, what do you th um, how much do consumers stand to benefit from, say, also low latency or um, connectivity issues? Uh, Mario? Yeah, at Solutions for IoT, we, our background is really mo mo mobile networks. So we, we've been through 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5Gs now around the corner. So we believe that 5G will solve a lot of these latency issues. But I think the data, the data management of all these data that will be generated is gonna be the problem. So really it's gonna be uh, something that we need to focus on solving. And I think Edge, edge uh, uh, will be the, the key to solving this uh, over data. Okay, thank you, Mario. Um, Geert? Yes, so, so as, as I previously said, so for some applications that are truly, truly real-time uh, real uh, driven because of safety, uh, I, I, I don't think uh, they will be kind of depending, depending on, uh, on, on network transmissions. Um, so even if 5G is around, will take quite some while and will never be kind of fully 100% uh, coverage. So, uh, but a lot of other functions uh, right, for training, obviously you, you can uh, collect data and, uh, and we have an interesting use case uh, where we, it's remote control. So operating a car or a robot by a human somewhere else. And then obviously you rely on video images to steer the car to speed the environment. And their latency, video latency is really key because uh, uh, if it's going to 100 or 200 milliseconds, then obviously uh, uh, there's a delay and that can lead to, uh, to danger. But that's, that's a use case where we, uh, uh, we help uh, uh, reducing latency significantly and, uh, and, and, have, and, and, and ensuring safety for, for the, the driver. Yes, uh, thank you, Geert. Uh, now that you go into use cases, I also want to delve into um, more descriptions of what the use cases look like for Edge AI in concert with the cloud, and also um, what challenges on the ground there exist in implementing these solutions? Uh, yeah, I can uh, answer quickly about that. It, some of the restrictions and what we are seeing now in the world that we are getting more smart AI solutions that need to be deployed and they need to be on the edge because the, the amount of processing power, the amount of uh, uh, latencies, you know, the, the gentleman just mentioned, you know, both Gert and Mario mentioned um, 
the latency of the, of the network. Okay, that's one thing. But one main thing that we are not uh, we haven't covered or, or talked about is the, the the fact that these AI hungry algorithms they need to be processed uh, to be able to uh, function at the edge. They need to be pro be processed fast. So there's a lot of um, use cases that are emerging from this new use case that we probably didn't even think about it before. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we are working on several use cases and, you know, in the automotive industry, as well as, you know, access control is where, you know, people now don't want to, for example, touch uh, the locks. They don't want to use the keys to automate the, 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 the access control. You need to rely on, on, on something, you know, uh, we believe it's, it's biometrics, uh, uh, maybe necessarily not just using the voice, but using two modality, for example, uh, face, face and voice, you will be able to get a much more accurate result. And the access control now it's solely run, but something you are, you don't have to bring key with you, don't have to remember any passcodes. And in order to run these two algorithms next to each other, you need to have some kind of neural network acceleration. And, 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 and if these devices at the edge are not powerful enough, uh, this will be really difficult. Uh, we we have an, another use case in Austria, actually. The motorcycle manufacturer was trying to get rid of the key uh, and they had automotive grade kind of um, uh, like a Raspberry Pi thing, a kind of thing device. And that Raspberry Pi, the chip on side was some ARM chip. It wasn't good enough to be able to run as complex alg algorithms as voice biometrics or even face. So straight away there we run into the problems, but if they were about to get rid of the key, we have to kind of have something that will be able to enable this in, 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 in like work with no connectivity. And then, and, 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 you know, then you can do ride sharing, uh, you know, sh sharing of apartments, Airbnb, quite a lot of stuff can be covered by use cases by being able to, you know, run AI directly there without ever leaving the devices. And this is what we, we see in the market anyway. I see. So we're kind of in a double bind of at the same time, we really need um, high performance. At the same time, we need it to be very power efficient. And that's where the challenge is. Um, Garrett, I saw you raise your hand again. Yes, uh, that's, that's actually one of the reasons why we cooperate with uh, Neuron is, uh, is that we, we also, like, like Nikolai, we, uh, we encounter these challenges that uh, more complex models uh, cannot always run on, on uh, existing uh, chipsets, like uh, uh, classical chipsets. And, and you have it also, you know, the motive uh, uh, and, and in robots as well, the challenge of, of keeping, keeping the bill of material low. So you can't throw a lot of hardware and CPU power to, to solve a single task. So on one hand, is this, this challenge of keeping, keeping it, uh, it's, uh, cost low, energy profile low, but still run these more complex uh, AI algorithms very accurately. That's, what, that's why we see a good uh, cooperation with uh, Knurron as, as one example is that uh, uh, it's an analogy uh, to what Nikolai just said, but we, we combine and uh, not, not for like key recognition, but actually for recognition of, of dangerous situations on the road, we combine on one hand, for instance, a lane departure, uh, a lane change. And on the other hand, we combine the uh, uh, face, uh, whether it's at, at, uh, distracted, uh, whether it's uh, looking to its smartphone, and these two combined are, give, are very rich in content because they give you uh, strong, strong information whether a potential dangerous situation is occurring. And uh, uh, so combining those, those sensors and information from different sensors into meaningful, meaningful, in this, in this case, alerts. And there we, uh, we see Knurron as, as, a, as, a, as a partner in order to do this, do this face detection um, at a relatively low price, uh, high quality, and where we can run our edge uh, algorithms on. Thank you, Geert. Um, Mario, would you also like to chime in? Yeah, so in our, in our use cases, what we have seen is in industrial automation, edge computers can, can help create machines that can sense, detect, and, and learn without being reprogrammed or programmed. Uh, in predictive maintenance, uh, it helps uh, it helps understand and predict when a machine is going to break before it breaks. So that saves saves uh, tons of money. Uh, with neuron, we believe that we can move into these uh, more uh, camera oriented solutions uh, that can help in, in in manufacturing smart manufacturing with uh, with solutions like like yours. So that's, that's what I wanted to say.
Thank you, Mario. So now we have um, an, a view of all these use cases. We have uh, predictive maintenance, we have um, auto vehicles, and we have, um, say, locks. And um, I just want to get more of a sense of um, at what pace and to what extent are these changes already happening in the market, say, towards the next 10 years or so? And um, what are the consumers' return on investment on these use cases? Um, Mario, would you like to continue with that? Sure. Uh, I, I believe that uh, AI will accelerate IoT. I think it's it's one of the main 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 issues that, uh, or one of the reasons that IoT has not been deployed massively as we expected it, and A AI will will help uh, explode this. One of the difficulties is explaining to our customers how the return of investment will will come, and I think uh, uh, in terms of uh, one smart lighting application that we have is is a no brainer that it will save a lot of money in energy and 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 that's key to explaining to them how they will get this uh, return on investment and i believe you know there is other areas that i'm not an expert but we have a good panel here that know a lot of uh uh automotive and so on so but that's the areas that we we've been exploding so I hope to hear what they have to say. <laughs> yes, thank you for your insights, Mario. Um, do you want to take, talk a bit more about your space as well, regarding the same question? Yes, uh, for sure, and, and thank you, Mario. Yeah, I, I want to know, in, in, uh, on respect to return on investment, um, I, I, we would say uh, customers are looking for a maximum of 12 months uh, return on, on investment as a, as, a, as a rule of thumb. What what may be more important than than uh, of what we may be a part of a return on investment is actually the quality of of the algorithm. Um, uh, so the what, what uh, Taraki uh, is able to bring to the table is the uh, thirty percent higher accurate algorithm, and an and an algorithm or a machine learning model actually produces better product or a new service, uh, and and the the more accurate that product or service is. Uh, the higher the business benefits, uh, so either in, in revenues or in, in customer satisfaction. And um, it, when you're considering a return on investment, it should uh, it should also include kind of the the downstream benefits of the algorithm that you're actually running. Uh, whether that's it could be safety in in, in uh, the increased safety in a car, increased comfort, comfort, or just new new services uh, uh, to uh, uh, to customers. So um, that is an important part. And, and with chipsets, uh, current chipset, they run 10 to 30 watts. And we see that we, you, one needs one watt chipsets. And uh, with the current chipsets, we can make so, such a marriage with our um, increased algorithm accuracy for our customers, runs at low power. And, uh, and with that, we always discuss with customers there are business benefits and try to stay within the 12, within the 12 months of a return on investment. I see, um, thank you, Geert. Um, so I think that's a very good illustration of um, how customers need to understand how they stand to benefit, but at what pace do you think um, the sort of understanding is um, in process already? How, how well is the market um, understanding this, these facts and also, just to what extent do you think um, these benefits will be accessible in the market? Is it going to be um, is it going to be more of a particular segment, or do you think it will be a very commonplace um, technology to see in the next, say, ten years or so? Yeah, I would not say it's limited to to a certain industry. Um, so I think it, it goes uh, it goes as for automotive as for other. Uh, Mobility services. Uh, we we focus on, on on robotics, delivery robots, and drones as well. For instance, uh, my, my colleagues here, uh, Mario and Nikolai, uh, also focus on on, on different uh, industries uh, um, as well. So I don't think it's limited to to a specific industry. Uh, secondly, you do you do see some 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 differences between regions in the world, and also between uh, kind of large corporates in how how quickly they move innovation to, to, the, to the market. And uh, I think uh, 
um, this will only accelerate in the in, in the coming years um, due to some kind of uh, yeah, co competitive threats uh, and, and companies that do bring new new products and new features to the market will will drive the pace and uh, either force force others to uh, to also join or or to uh, uh, to reinvent themselves in another way. Thank you, Geert. Um, Nicola, would you also like to chime in about um, the space of voice and biometrics? Absolutely. So one of the things that uh, that uh, both Geert and Mario uh, mentioned, it's it's actually completely true. Like it's it's I don't think it's going to be one segment alone. It's going to be several segments at the same time. Uh, what we at my was also believing that the the shift that we are moving now at the edge and especially what Gert was saying about processing data and and having you know being able to to kind of show the return on investment i think that will exponentially grow and the reason why we think it will grow because new business area will, will emerge so suddenly we, we will have new business models new business areas that that probably no, none of us even in the room are thinking about so so uh, at the end of the day it's uh, not uh, the best technology to win or the best algorithm it's technology that enables something different uh, a, a total paradigm shift in how we are doing stuff you know for example you know <laughs> three four years ago before we started my voice me and my co-founder went to silicon valley and uh, one of our advisors byron han who spent 30 years at apple told us the best technology in the world is the technology they don't see. So if we can use edge AI to improve the lives of the people around us without them actually noticing directly what's happening, I, we believe, I, I, I truly believe that we will have a more efficient and a better, better um, decisions will be made. You know, like uh, the, 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 for the, for example, for, for, for factory automation and what Mario was just discussing now previously, you have a lot of factories, especially here in Norway, where I, where I am, they are, they're very efficient, but actually they could save 30, 40% less energy if they used algorithms at the edge. Okay, tomorrow is minus 10 degrees or plus 10 degrees. Okay, automate, put the air condition on earlier. If this is powered singularly by every edge device, you know, looking at the weather, looking at of, of the production cost, it, all of this is dancing, like you said, in symmetry, not necessarily in a cloud. It can be dancing at the edge as well. I think we will be saving uh, a planet, a lot of resources, and we will get a more effective future for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicola. Um, now that actually I'm also very interested in um, what Mario was saying earlier with regards to uh, predictive maintenance, if I'm getting that. Um, so as, as, um, we can, as we can sense, um, that's going to probably be quite revolutionary for um, society at large in terms of um, what consumption would look like, what the cost would be for, for um, things we are very accustomed to. Uh, Mario, what would you say, like as a big picture, how does um, edge AI technology and your space um, impact society at large? And how can we see the manifestations of that? Yeah, I, I think uh, edge AI is very important as it, as it continues to, as companies continue to make uh, AI type of MCUs or microcontrollers that have already a, some AI platform in, in them. Uh, for example, we have a customer that is using our platform and they are doing agriculture. So they have a bunch of uh, sensors to do uh, predictions on, based on data that is gathered like uh, 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 humidity, temperature on the air, temperature on, on, on the ground and so on. They can opt the growth of plants. And I think uh, as, as our Population is growing. We need we need to use the resources uh, more efficiently, and they are they are on a on a great path uh, to do this. And we are seeing it seeing it in in, in Latin America, uh, where where they're not very efficient uh, in in using technology, and as 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 they are getting smarter. In, 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 in doing these predictions, they are asking for more and more information and, 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 and having more, more uh, artificial intelligence in, 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 in the, in the mm -hmm. microcontrollers and in our solution. So, so that's, that's what I think uh, we, we, we need to be and we need to go. 
Thank you, Mario. Yes, um, so that certainly does illustrate the extent to which AJI is going to be shaping how we, uh, how we, um, how we go about in markets and safe costs and also impact human lives uh, throughout society. Um, going back to, to, um, to Nicola earlier, you were also talking about the same topic. And uh, could you please dive in a little bit more as well as to how biometrics is going to look like um, as landscape in the future, if you have to paint a picture, say, for instance, uh, for the consumer and average public to visualize. Yeah, definitely. So the, the, the way kind of we look at the market and why we believe in voice, it's the fastest, it's the, not the next uh, user interface. We believe it's the final. Uh, as you can see now in this talk today, we can, we can uh, give so much more information by talking rather than writing there's there's like a, a higher speed of not only to, uh, not only receiving but also giving information and how we believe uh, th th this will shape the world around us we believe that uh, your user account your identity your digital identity for example currently now it's tied to account so if you have your google home or amazon alexa or whatever it is you're tied to account you need to type a password and then if you go to somewhere else or you know to somebody else's house that's basically useless so we believe that you will be able to go from your home to your car to your office and and basically carry that biometric identity with you regardless of where you are so so what what will happen then is that that you will suddenly have a more streamlined way of living so you will be able to say you know hey um you know hey my voice or, hey google whatever device it is uh, and say hey can you can you order a pizza for me and mario and Gert? Gar and just by you saying this you would not only order a pizza, it would understand the meaning, it would charge it biometrically to your bank account, which is again tied to your voice and your face, but now in this instance voice. So we believe then in, you know, that the future, how we see today will rapidly change. You know, the, the, uh, some of the use cases around automotive, for example, um, automotive industry, we work quite a lot in Germany and they're not looking at the car as a, as a car anymore, as a transport vehicle, they're looking at it as a, as, a, as, a, as a platform. So now imagine if you look at the car as a platform, what kind of services will come on top of it? Who will benefit? Insurance companies, you know, will we be able to do banking while you're driving? You know, eventually you won't even drive the car. You will sit in it and use it at your office. So, so, so maybe that future is 10 years in front of us. But everything else is moving rapidly. rapidly. So we, you know, it's, um, it's quite exciting. Uh, time we live in and and one uh, thing i wanted to mention that I, I forgot to say previously is that we have a lot of supercomputer and a lot of a uh, lot of computing power around the world but where i believe we will move is like is that we will have a swarm like if you look at the a swarm of bees we have a lot of these small microcomputers microchips like neurons and they will work around everywhere we go and they will talk to each other and they will make decisions better decisions better predictions and everything rather than having one centralized unit that operates in a cloud and has sensors at the edge so i believe it will we will we, we went to cloud big data i think we are now still having big data but it's becoming smaller and less reliant on on large models and and, and everything and, and and it's a it's exciting future Thank you, Nicola. So a federated decentralized system that allows me to not have to remember my passwords anymore, which I have a net for forgetting. That certainly is a future I'm looking towards too. And um, as we are now, now out of time for this panel, I would like to thank you all, uh, Mario, Gert, and Nicola for your time and insights. It's truly been a pleasure speaking with you all and we look forward to see the advancements of Edge AI in your spaces and how we can make AI accessible and beneficial for everyone and everywhere. Thank you. Thank you.